Hello and welcome back. Welcome back. Nice to see you all again. Thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Okay, so today we're talking about facts about Britain. All right, some of these you may know, some may be different, some might just be from my perspective and what I want to show you. But they are facts nevertheless, some of them more interesting, some of them a little bit more unusual, you may not have heard of. So I'll try and make this interesting because generally facts aren't very exciting or interesting. So I'll add my two cents worth to elaborate and to um, maybe embellish them a little bit more. Right, okay, so I'm just going to jump onto the other screen and have a little look what we got over here. Have a look. I have obviously made a list. I've tried to, to be um, proactive and make it interesting and, and write a few things down so we can uh, look at them together. Although this camera isn't as good quality, uh, I still use it for another angle, so I might flip back between the two screens. All right, okay, let's have a little look then. So facts about Britain. All right, so... I've broken it down into categories to make it a little bit more easier to digest. But if you want to know about Britain or if you're doing an exam about Britain or if you're just doing something at school about the UK, Britain, then uh, then hopefully this will be interesting to you. So like I said, I'll try and make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more lively. I want to try and have some fun as well. All right. So first category. Now, <laughs> I... I I am I am human, so just bear with me, all right? I, I haven't spell-checked this 100%. I've gone over it quickly, all right? So if you see any mistakes, please don't crucify me uh, in the comments. So, like I said, I am only human. Right in. So the first category we got, well, widely known, widely known facts about the UK or about Britain. All right. Um, Britain is made up of four countries. I sometimes get asked, is Britain England? Is Britain the UK? Britain, what, what is it? Which part is called Britain? And so uh, sometimes I have to explain to students that Britain is actually all four. You know, the UK is all four parts of Britain, all four countries. So you've got um, Northern Ireland, Scotland, actual England itself um, and Wales. Now, very little gets said about Wales, but uh, well, you, as we come on to the later on down the bottom, you'll see that Wales does bring a lot of uh, a lot of value to the UK, but it does get overlooked. All right, so made up of the four countries, aka the UK, sometimes affectionately referred to as Blighty, especially in the old films, like World War films. You know, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, I used to, I can't wait till we go back to Blighty." So Blighty is like a, a shortened version of Britain. Blighty. Some people don't like it. My, yeah, some people don't like it at all. All right. Obviously, the capital is London. You all know that. And the official language is English. Everybody knows that. Um, what you don't know is that England, and especially London, is very multi multicultural and very accepting and relaxed and happy to have people from all over the world. You know, if somebody um, speaks with a strong accent, we go, oh. Where, where are you from? That sounds really different and interesting. Where are you from? And they may, uh, if, they're, if they're not too shy, they may express where they're from and, you know, maybe um, share some interesting thing about their country, you know, or their food or their culture. And you might find that you could probably go around a lot of our cities, such as London, and be able to eat food from all around the world. You can get Italian food, well, maybe American food, Italian food, Spanish food, um... Yeah, all, all European foods, Mexican foods, Asian foods, all different types of foods, in, uh, especially in London. It's really, really a big, big menu of foods. How exciting. How exciting is that? You know, if, uh, if you're from another country and you're, you're missing food from your, uh, your own place, then, yeah, you could probably get it in London. If not, somebody will make it for you. So that's the great thing about London, that people don't talk about much. Okay. Uh, the British monarchy is the oldest in the world. Sorry, one of the oldest in the world, uh, with Queen Elizabeth II being the longest reigning monarch. Well, obviously, if, if you haven't heard already, our Queen Elizabeth II died not so long ago. And now we have um, King Charles. And I'm not sure if he's Queen, King Charles III or something like that. And so he is now the, the monarch of the UK. And so we're in the process of all, all our money and our stamps 
um, changing over to his picture. So our money is going to have the picture of the king on it. And also like the stamps. If you don't know what a stamp is, that's sign language for stamp. If you don't know what a stamp is, it's a little kind of ticket, I would say, that, that you that is normally a bit sticky on the back. You, you pay for it at the post office and you can put it on your letter or your postcard or whatever it is you want to send through the Royal Mail. Unfortunately, it's not actually owned by the, the, um, the government now. The Royal Mail is a private company, but they've still kept the logo and the name for, for some time in the contract. So the Royal Mail, the, the stamp is going to have uh, a picture of the king on it soon when they, they've used up all the old ones, I guess, or until they become no longer valid. But yeah, a lot of the a lot of the money will take a bit of time to transfer over from the queen to the king. All right, okay, so what have we got? The Union Jack is the national flag of the United Kingdom, composes of the flag of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and um, uh, and England. It's very difficult to draw. <laughs> if you're a young person in in school, like you know, you draw your flag or you draw your neighbor's flag, you know, it's normally fairly straightforward, you know. But the Union Jack is very difficult to draw freehand, anyway. All right. Um, the English language generated in England, obviously. Yeah, we all know that. OK. Um, one, now, I think Chinese is has more speakers of it, but more widely spoken, apparently, is English is um, because it's not just used on the International Space Station, but also for aviation uh, to, to mitigate a lot of the accidents and incidents due to communication. Um, it's more kind of like the, the known language for business um, and and then a lot of uh, cinema, a lot of cinema and, and the news and a lot of technologies are normally shared across English, uh, you know, Hollywood, business, American. And, all that. and I think because you've got America, you've got Australia, you've got Canada, you've got New Zealand, uh, South Africa and the UK are the I think are the main biggest countries that speak English as their first language. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. All right. So the next category we've got now is places of interest. Now, if I don't know if you've heard of Stonehenge or if you've ever been to Stonehenge, but it's a very interesting place. Very, very interesting. And let me just switch back to the other camera for a moment. There we go. Right. Yeah, it's a very interesting place. Um, not only is it a World Heritage Site, UNESCO, I mean, I think that's United Nations um, special places, I don't know. But they're preserved and protected, all right? So you can't just go around and smash them up or, or uh, you know, if you own the land, you can't just take them down. Or, or if you're a member of the public and you deface it or you devalue it or criminal behavior, it is considered an offense. All right. OK. Yeah, it's in Wiltshire. I had to look that up. I, I didn't know myself. I've been to Stonehenge a number of times, uh, especially in my camper van and stayed there. It's a very interesting place. It's on, I think they call it um, Salisbury, Salisbury Plain. Now, a lot of that land around there is owned by the military. And there's a really big military brace just on the edge of that. And back in the... Uh, Back in the 70s, a lot of hippies used to convene around there and they had a lot of, what do we call it, festivals and things like this. The most recent one, I think, was in the early 90s and I'm sure it's called Battle of the Beanfield. Now, I think it's to do with the field next door and there was a big clash between the police and the, the hippies going to this free festival and, and a lot of um, people were talking about their rights to be able to go on free land and things like that. And we'll come to that in another video, um, land owned by the people. So that was a massive, big, um, I'm not going to say scandal, but a movement in, in between people of the land and the police. There was a massive clash back in the, the 90s, probably a knock on effect from from the 80s and the mining uh, and the, uh, the government and the strikes. Uh, so that was a really big deal in, in our his recent history. OK, so, yeah, uh, very spiritual gathering, often uh, um, the summer solstice. I think there's a different name for the solstice winter and the, and the summer one. But a lot of people gather there. Some of them are Druids or pagans um, and, and they, they, they have a right, apparently, to, to go there on those days. And they can enter into into close right up to the stones, because nowadays 
that there's a it's very touristy there's a very big fence around it so you can't get that close you can't actually touch it you're, you're quite away from it uh, and then outside of that fence um the, uh, everybody else can go and, and sort of see it from a distance but you have to pay to get closer so I don't know maybe it's probably 20 meters away you can go and look at it for free but if you want to go 10 meters away and go to the visitor center and get a little bus or shuttle down to the actual site because there's a big car park further away from the actual site itself it uh it, it does improve the view I suppose and the experience and like I say there's a there's a whole visitor center so there's lots of schools and children and and uh, tourists coming from all around the world to see Stonehenge and don't get me wrong it is very interesting and very very old but at the end of the day the end of the day it is just a pile of rocks now who wants to pay like 40 50 euros pounds to see a pile of rocks it escapes me it really escapes me the idea of somebody might pay that amount of money to look at rocks when you can see it for free just a few more yards away now i know you don't get the visitor center experience but you can google it online you can get an idea about it you can see it you can see the landscape and and you can google as much as you want so why you would pay that fathoms me i'm unfathomable that is okay so fathomable as you probably understood or you probably uh, figured out means I can't understand I, I really can't figure it out I can't fathom why right okay so yeah that's the uh, that's Stonehenge all right moving on now so we got the underground also known as the tube is one of the oldest uh, and most extensive metro systems in the world now, I took my daughter there when she was like 16 and I got her to to understand how to use it. It's really clever. The the, the map is color coded of, of different lines like the Jubilee line and the Waterloo line and things like that. And so it doesn't take long to understand the, the concept of how to use it. And you can just use your debit card, you know, your, your little plastic card to tap in and tap out. Or Londoners often or people visiting London will buy an Oyster card. So that's just for London transport. But yeah, I took my daughter to, to, to use it and get to know it and understand it and um, be able to see the maps around because there's lots of maps around on the tube as well. You go, oh, darn, where am I going now? Oh, I'll have a look at the map. Right, so I'm here and I want to go up there. Right, okay, so, oh, so I need to get this blue one. That's called the whatever, I don't know, let's just say Baker line. You get on that one and it takes me, ah, good. So it's very user-friendly. It was very, very user friendly. And, and it's actually not a bad price. It's fairly, fairly reasonable for the amount of distance you can cover. Like there's different zones, one, two, three, four, etc. So it is really well used. It's definitely a lot quicker and easier than driving around London. Not only have you got like the congestion charge, but you've got the ULES, ultra low, I don't know, ultra low congestion, ultra low emission zone, something like that. ULES. And there's a big controversy about that. People are taking down the cameras. Oh my goodness, a whole fiasco, fiasco. Bad situation going on around that. Okay, ULES, underground. So I like the underground. It's, it's very British, it's very interesting. You know, like, like you gotta stand on one side so people can walk quickly up the other side of the escalator. Uh, the tubes are often Mm, I'm not going to say super clean, but th th it's fairly well. It runs quickly, so and it's fairly safe as well. Fairly safe. The, the UK is pretty safe, actually. Uh, as much as I like to think it's not, <laughs> it is pretty safe. All right, so that's the underground. I like the underground. It's good. You'll give it a try. It's well worth giving it a try. All right, Tower of London, historical castle and prison with fascinating history. Mm. The British Museum, London... House, uh, in London houses a vast collection of historical artifacts around the world. <laughs> now, this was recently um, quite popular in the news and on some of the other places I read articles about how the British Museum come to have in its possession some of these artifacts. And lots of people were saying, oh, it was stolen from this country and that country and you should give it back and it's not fair, you know, that, that's worth a lot and it means a lot to our people and you've stolen it. 
Now that's another conversation for another day. So I'll not jump into that right now, but yeah, interesting conversation. Okay, Tower Bridge in London, famous Baskul and suspension bridge that spans the River Thames. Okay, yeah. Pretty iconic, really. A lot of people have seen it or know about it, but uh, pretty iconic. I bet I went over the top back when I was a child. There, there's like, um, I don't know what we call it, like passageways going across the top and you get a really good view. That's quite nice. And also not, not mentioned here is um, the Millennium Eye. All right, that big, big round wheel, the Millennium Wheel or the, the Eye of London or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that, that was one of the first ones that were uh, built, one of the first Ferris wheels that, that was built for, uh, you know, on a large scale for a city. Now, you, I think they're in a lot of different countries. I think they're in lots and lots of countries. But yeah, the Millennium Wheel or the Millennium Eye, whatever you want to call it, London Eye, is, uh, is also quite good. It's not too expensive, but it's also quite good to go on it and um, you know, have a really good view of London. I like it. I like it. Took my daughter on there as well. This was going back like, I don't know, nearly 10 years ago. Okay, next category, we've got maritime. Maritime, so, so waves of the water, all right? The English Channel, the body of water, separates England and France. One of the busiest shipping lanes. It's actually really quite a harsh. I, I think I don't know whether it's because it, the channel goes really low in in the sea, um, or, or because it narrows. But it's really a dangerous place. If, if you some people swim across the channel, I don't know why they want to do that. But it's a really really dangerous little little bit of water. Yeah, surprisingly so. A lot of uh, a lot of um, people lost their lives there. Okay. All right. An interesting thing about maritime as well, about I don't know if the uh, lots of other countries have got this, is we have um, RNLI Royal National Lifeboat Institute, because we're an island and we we've we've got a long history of. Um, people going out on boats and, you know, and the Navy and things like that. There, there's this Royal Navy, Royal National Lifeboat Institute. So there's like volunteers that actually jump on a boat and go out to rescue other people that are in danger. It's been around for quite a while, especially because like I said, because we're an island and we've got lots of lighthouses and things like that. We've got some treacherous uh, coastline and lots and lots of people have died over over the uh, over the decades. So yeah, Royal National Lifeboat Institute. I'm pretty sure it's a charity, uh, and everybody loves it because we all enjoy using the water. All right, okay. So what else we got? Uh, yeah, I said busy. Uh, rich maritime history with famous explorers like Captain James Cook and Sir Francis Drake. Now we don't actually talk a lot about the these people. But uh, I think they are probably quite pivotal in uh, in the um, uh, the naval uh, and exploring part back in the nineteenth and eighteenth century. Mm. All right. So what else we got? Fun fact. Fun <laughs> is a fun fact really fun? <laughs> Not always, is it? Not always. It's just another way of saying. And here's another fact. <laughs> all right. Okay. So all right. A little bit of information for you a bit of information all right um in its prime during the 19th century the british royal navy was unparalleled naval force both in terms of size and capabilities uh so it had like massive world um battleships uh it could get all around the world and and, and obviously we we were in uh, Africa, Asia, and the Americas, uh, also the, around the Pacific, had hundreds of these warships with a big naval bases around the world as well, uh, and just the supremacy of technology, okay? Boat technology, warship technology was superior to anybody else back in its heyday. Uh, so so that, 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 is, that maritime aspect is really a pivotal part of... of um, the United Kingdom becoming so big and and um, stretching out so far. That's another interesting video we can do in the future about the uh, the stretch and reach of, of um, the UK and the positive and negative aspects of whether a country felt 
because I've had this conversation with an Indian friend of mine when I was couch surfing. A really nice guy. I, we had a great time. You know, we, we did lots of things together. I think I was in Cambodia at the time. And it was an interesting conversation about his perspective of how um, Britons, in, you know, people from the UK come over there and, and sort of raped and pillaged his country. Uh, and I agree, yeah, that's an awful thing to happen. That's an awful, terrible thing to happen. You know, nobody should be raping and pillaging anybody's country. So that's an awful thing. But on the flip side, and now I'm not discounting that that's an awful thing to happen, all right? I validate that was an awful thing to happen. Very, very bad. But one of the positives that came out of it was uh, a lot of the rail networks, a lot of technology and a lot of um, helping the country um, move forward in, 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 uh, in a lot of aspects of um, engineering, for example, and infrastructure and things like that. And now there is a case to be made, this is what he said, that the country would have developed more on its own if we hadn't intervened. Now, but there's another side to that where actually you look at countries that have never been invaded, never been, what's the word? Um, well, yeah, never been invaded. Uh, I can't think of the right word now. And, and there are a few countries, for example, in Africa that have never been, I'm trying again, trying to get it, trying to get the word, never been colonized. <sighs> Took me a long time to get that word, sorry, colonized. So there are a few countries in Africa that have never been colonized. And these countries are still very far back in regards to technology um, and, and being... Uh, a second or third or, or first world country. So there's an argument either way. I mean, we could look into that if you like as a, an interesting video. Maybe you could give me your perspective down in the comments, see what you think. And, and also you've got to take into context that the Britain's empire was kind of like one of the last major empires to be able to um, colonize and, and give balance uh, to, to countries but prior to that there was the Roman Empire you know and the Ottoman Empire and many other empires that that came to England that came to our country and raped and pillaged our women and villages and, and things like that but that's all history you know nobody is still alive now from those periods of time and the Romans did bring some amazing things with, with their engineering of water and, and baths and roads and, and, and fighting techniques. So we learned a lot from the Romans. We did keep a lot of the good parts from what the Romans brought. But yes, they, they invaded us. But, you know, time has moved on a little bit now. It's part of history. So anyway, I don't want to get anybody upset. I don't want to offend anybody. It's just, just thoughts. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the next one then was uh, Industrial Revolution began uh, allegedly in the 18th century, leading to significant advancements in technology and industries. Uh, this was also shared with the, uh, because of the um, uh, Imperial Navy and, and the, the colonization, this was shared with lots of other territories and countries. So lots of other countries have now, what's the word, um, flourished and, and enjoyed the, the uh, some of the positive aspects of, of, uh, of Britain. But I was just going to go back over that Industrial Revolution. There was a lot more to it than, than just um, cotton and trading and weavers, you know, with steam. And, and um, one of the other videos I talked about, um, what's his name now? Isambard Kingdom Brunei. Uh, and, and all that DNA within, within the, the humans of, of Britain. Well, obviously around the world as well, but 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 I'm talking specifically now about Britain and, and that kind of let's build it in the shed. Let's individual people building and learning and growing and making stuff, you know, with that culture of of like Dragon's Den. Well, I've invented this. I've made that uh, in my own garden, in my own shed. And they're able to express it and share it with the world. So that, that's quite a, an interesting aspect. Um, engineering pedigree within the UK. Obviously, it's now been superseded, I would say, probably with um, German. German engineering now, I would say, is far superior. There's a whole load of reasons for that as well. But yeah, I, we all like German engineering now. 
Right then, let's move on, moving on. Culture, culture, okay. So, the UK is known for its literary uh, traditions like uh, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, and many, many other great authors. Uh, the Royal Society, founded in 1660, one of the world's oldest scientific academies. Okay, okay. Now, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, what else we got? Um, the British Library, one of the largest libraries in the world, has an extensive collection of books and manuscripts. Probably stolen from around the world, yeah. Uh, the Queen's Guard. Now, I think the Queen's Guard is now probably the King's Guard. Because, obviously, now we've got a king. Um, well known for their distinctive red uniforms and bearskin hats. So, really tall hats. Britain has a rich history of royal palaces, including Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, and Palaces of Westminster. You can visit some of these. You can pay money and go and visit some of them. They are very illustrious. Illustrious. Okay. And got moving back on to pop culture. Let's have a look at this pop culture bit business. Okay, sorry, let's move on to that one bit. All oh, right, okay, we're back on this one again. Right. Um, it's known for iconic red double decker buses, the black cabs, the red phone boxes, and letter boxes. I think I got a 15 there. Cricket, now everybody, no, not everybody. When, when I visit lots of countries, often people talk to me about cricket or football. I've been in some amazing places in the middle of nowhere, miles from anywhere. Well, on, on top of a mountain, for example. Uh, and, and, and the staff there, the young people there, want to talk to me about football. I think we're talking about Liverpool. I was, ah, so excited and energetic. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know a lot about football or for the American audience, soccer. Um, but yeah, cricket's well well liked. But football is the biggest by far in the UK. Now, unfortunately, we do have a really bad reputation. Now, like a lot of countries, we do have a very dark, negative side to the country. We we do have um, those that are. Um, how do I put this? Those that are quite physical and and and, and have a lot of energy that often spoils over into into aggression especially at somewhere like a football match but there's a lot of energy and competition and and probably some archaic and caveman instincts of of rivalry against another another cave you know and so football is one of those places where it spills over into aggression and so we have this bad reputation of football hooligans football hooliganism uh, and fighting. There's films on it. It's that bad. We have films on it. We have quite a cultural history, especially between a couple of well-known clubs. I'm not going to names. But there is actual films about them. So maybe, maybe that's why Britain was, uh, I don't know, good at fighting because of football. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Okay. So then we got the Beatles. Almost everybody around the world is, has heard of some of the Beatles songs. I like some of the Beatles songs, but I moved on with the times a little bit now. I really like 21 Pilots. I think they're really, really super. 21 Pilots. I sound really old now. Super. But I think they're exciting and, and current and, and uh, good. 21 Pilots. Really good. I like them. Give them a, give them a try. Okay. Uh, the Rolling Stones. Again, more of my parents' era. I do like Queen. Now, that's the name of a, a music band, okay, if you're not familiar. Very, very big in the uh, 80s and 90s. Really, really big. Rock and roll bands. Okay. Uh, and then it's, we got like 1960s, The Swinging London. Now, that's not to be few confused with swingers, all right? Swingers are people like to go to parties as a couple and they swap. Maybe the man will go with uh, another man's wife and wife, woman and things like that. And then there's this whole thing where they, they have a bowl an empty bowl and they put their car keys in it and a woman would pick up the car keys and you know it is a way of having a, a switcheroo without without knowing who's who okay so london swinging era brought about the cultural revolution in fashion and music 
yeah, like the Beatles and things like that and rock and roll. And, uh, a very big shift from the old traditional mother and father ruling the roost. And then lots of energy and enthusiasm, money and, and light goes into the music and music and fashion industries. You know, the young person, a bit more affluent, got some money to spend, likes going out for some beers. They, they had quite the, the, uh, the time to do as they pleased. I, I guess because they lived at home for a bit longer and, and had more money to spend. All right, what else? Okay, so that was a subcategory. All right, next category, country. So this is the last bit really now. You know, not going on too long. Um, I just wanted to highlight the, the value of the other countries that are part of the UK um, that don't get talked about quite as much. So Scotland, you may have heard of bagpipes, you may have seen kilts, you may have heard of the Loch Ness Monster. Scotland is an amazing place. They've got some different laws uh, and they've got some of their own different money as well. But Scotland, although, although it's not my favourite place because it's cold, I've visited Scotland and it's an awesome place. It really is. There's just the landscape, the people are really, really nice. Um, they've got so much going on. I mean, even the, the Queen, when she was alive, used to have a holiday home there. It's that amazing. You know, Scotland is brilliant. I recommend, try if you've got time here in the UK, try and visit Scotland. It's, it's a great place to go. All right. Northern Ireland, um, Giant Causeway. I've never been to Northern Ireland. I've been to Southern Ireland, which is now part of the EU. But uh, I really enjoyed Ireland. I've got some, well, I had some family in Ireland. So I've spent some time there, visited there a few times. Uh, I've never actually been to the Co Giant's Causeway. But Ireland is a lovely place. Oh, it's so much more relaxed and laid back. It's, it's like very countryfied. It's like we're in the countryside. So things happen a lot slower. And yes, they like Scotland. They like their alcohol and beer. And much like um, England. I think England, Scotland and Wales are, sorry, England, Scotland and Ireland are the, the, the three biggest drinkers, I suppose. Uh, if I would see them uh, in another country. So yeah, Ireland's also very beautiful, very laid back, very distant. And then they, yeah, just slightly, well, very different, very different sort of culture. But again, we love Ireland. Ireland's great. I, I would, again, visit, visit Ireland. Um, very famous for their Irish Guinness. If you get a chance, so that's an alcoholic beverage, very dark. I think they call it a stout. So one of the other YouTubers I saw recently said about in, in America, they have beer. Whereas in the UK, we have um, ale, lager, stout. Um, and then we've got obviously ciders and things like that. So stout is is quite popular, especially in Ireland. It's quite filling, apparently, and quite heavy in the stomach, like like having a meal. So you can see why some drinkers don't eat a, a lot of food, because they're full up on stout. <laughs> yeah, bitter, lager, and ales are quite, are quite posh these days, ales. They're quite, what's the word, gentrified. Now, the word gentrified means that it's now more popular, more expensive and more raised up in in elevation of status so for example you might you might live in one part of a of a city and then the government spend lots of money on that part of the city rejuvenating it spending money making it better and then the house prices goes up because it's a gentrified area the area has been become more posh and desirable and so that can happen with things. You know, you can have objects that, that used to be just regular everyday object. And now all of a sudden it's become gentrified. Everybody has one. It's, it's exciting. It's different. It's worth more. So gentrification. I don't know where I was going in that conversation. I apologize. What are we talking about? Um, ales. Ales, yeah. All right, so yeah, Scotland and Ireland, amazing places, so much heritage, so many interesting things happening there, great tourism, you're going to love it. Okay, Welsh and Welsh mountains, choirs, mining heritage. Um, again, they have brought a lot to the UK, like in the mining, in their, in, their, um, in their culture. They've normally been a little bit further out because of the mountains, they, they've been... Um, a little bit away from England for, for 
for uh, for quite some time until we've really got in the the trains and the road network. So more and more in in the uh, the last sort of century, they've become more cohesive with England. We've got a, quite a few bridges, especially in the south. But they've played a pivotal role in, in bringing value to the UK, bringing value to England. And I don't think they get enough recognition, not just their choirs or their food or their, their, their hospitality. Again, I know I'm singing the praises to everybody, but the Welsh people are very, very hospitable and welcoming. And they brought so much, not just in, in literacy um, uh, and engineering, but yeah, the, the Welsh people don't get enough validation. They're amazing people. I love Wales. For me, it's very close. I, I can get to Wales in a couple of hours, enjoy the countryside. It's really scenic uh, and beautiful. Yeah, Wales is awesome. So, so that's all my categories, really, for fun facts. Fun facts. Facts of, uh, facts of uh, Britain. Blighty, if you will. So, yeah, that, that's all I've got for now. There's uh, not a huge amount on there, but um, it's, it's all I had. Okay. So, if there's any interesting things, if there's any interesting things that you'd like to share about when you visited England, when you visited the UK, what you like or don't like about the UK, let me know in the comments. Tell me, tell me your experiences. Did you come to the UK and it was pouring down with rain? Because every time people speak to me about coming to the UK, my students, they said, oh, it was great, but it was raining and it was cold. So, yeah, I apologize. I apologize. I'm apologizing for our weather. The weather is is not great. Uh, that's why we all go to Spain on holiday. That's why we all go to other countries on holiday. That's why we all leaving the country. Uh, the weather in the UK is not the best. Uh, I, I can't do anything about it. But on the flip side, and I always do try and look for a flip side for balance, we do have a lot of greenery, a lot of lush landscapes, a lot of beautiful countryside, a lot of interesting topography. There's lots and lots of amazing things to discover just in the countryside of, of the whole of the UK. I mean, we, we still visit parts of our own country and we're excited and in awe of, of the um, amazing beauty nature has just in our own country. So we're, we're very grateful for that. Our country does have beautiful landscapes. Okay, so we apologize for the weather. And like I said, there's nothing we can do about that. Other than that, I guess, it is a great country. We've got our problems. We've got some bad apples, if you will. You know, some, some people that aren't very nice. But, but you get that everywhere and in other con every country. And I just hope you don't experience any of those bad apples. All in all, though, it's a great country. The UK, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, amazing country. The people are great. The infrastructure is oh, it's really good. Now, it's, it might not be as good as, say, Germany or Switzerland, where there is a, a, an abundance of money to throw at infrastructure. And I see that as the future. If you if you invest in your infrastructure for your country, then it will it will um, become more and more. I don't know, um, affluent. It will seem better for everybody. But we are we are trying very hard. You know, I sometimes think that we're a good compromise to America. You know, America says they're great. America's got a lot of amazing things going on. But they've also got their own issues and their own problems. And is it a vast country? And also, they're, they're quite far away from Europe. So they, they seem to be in their own bubble sometimes. You know, they, they're just constantly looking inwards at America. And they don't take much time to, to look at the other um, colourful countries around the world. And that's why I'm lucky that, that I live in the UK. I can go under the tunnel and drive to Europe from where I am. You know, I can um, take a short short hop on an airplane. I can even get a coach or even get the train from the UK straight across to Europe. So I'm very, very lucky in that respect. So UK is a great place to visit. Our weather isn't great, but not just their healthcare is amazing and free. 
It, it is a really good country. The people make it good. And the people are fighting a lot of the time to make it a good country. We're fighting against our government, which like American government and some other governments around the world, seem to be catering for corporations and other big financial industries that, 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 that are trying to persuade the government to help the, help the corporation and the companies and the big businesses and not the people. So we're constantly fighting about against that. But we are trying to make strides on the, the world stage. So I read recently that, and I didn't know this, um, in 2021, the UK, the UK had 50% of its, of its energy consumption or production from production, sorry, production from uh, renewable resources. Now, we just drive up our motorway and you can see solar farm after solar farm after solar farm. Out in the Atlantic, where we got lots and lots of wind, there's, there's hundreds of wind farms. So we are making strides forward to be a better country. So if you do want to move to England, then it's a great country to be in. It's, it's really well situated. There's a lot of uh, great universities, a lot of great education. And it is a great country, but we do have our problems. We do have our problems. I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that. There's a lot of problems in the UK. But overall, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So tell me what your experiences are. Let me know in the comments. Was it the weather? Was it the trains? Was it the traffic? Let me know. Let me know in the comments. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Uh, take care and uh, keep learning English. And have fun. Bye-bye for now.